about Camol. You can get started, I'm sure the people will be joining it meanwhile. So I'm Batuan or Batu. Um, again, thank you all of them um, for joining our Haltech Investment Conference. I see some familiar names and faces, but for those who don't know about us, we are a startup club. Um, we are a global entrepreneur community. We connect companies with investors to series of pitch nights and investment conferences. Since 2019, over the time, we organized more than hundreds of events. We supported dozens of companies through, uh, you know, in their fundraising and growth journey. And today, we are um, having six promising health tech companies from Europe and the US. Each company will have seven minutes to pitch. That will be followed by 10 minutes feedback and discussion with the advisory panel members, which we have five great investors from Top VC. I'm going to talk about it. But before that, uh, let me quickly go through the presenting companies and the order. So um, the first page is Harm Life 360. They are a behavioral technology company currently focusing on people with diabetes. And the second page is Salutex. A uh, medical cannabis treatment company following HydroHex hacks. They've created virtual workout experience um, in swimming pools across Europe. Uh, fourth page is Enhanced D, a single digital hub for um, self diabetes management. And following Sain, they are a platform to you know, create connection between healthcare providers and patients. And the final page is Somnia AB. They have patented solution to eliminate and stop snoring. And yes, um, I'm going to do advisory panel members. Um, first of all, as a startup club, I really want to thank you all for accepting our request. Very glad to have you all. Um, I will ask you to introduce yourself, uh, but let me quickly go through the list. We have Antonio Motola, Senior Associated SABs Partners, Adam Dakin. Partner at Dream Adventures, Emily Zen, Senior Associate at Niv Enterprise Associate, Matthew, Matthew Foran, um, Senior Program Manager, Lead and Sports Health Tech Partners, and Johannes Blasch, mm -hmm. our Principal at Call Storm Ventures. So, yeah, um, Antonio, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. <clears throat> Hi uh, to everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation. Yes, um, so I'm part of a, a Sabis team. It's a VC based in Barcelona, relatively young. We are just uh, launching an, uh, the, the second fund. We, we work in healthcare in a very broad, let's say, meaning of the word. We invest in biotech, but also digital health therapeutics and, and also health tech. Uh, my background, I'm more biotech guy, but from the PhD, a postdoc in different countries. I live in seven different countries and work in research, but then I founded also a company in the healthcare space in uh, 2021. And then oh. I I found myself in the VC space and there was an in-cap the previous to join us. That wasn't a question here. I said, I did put to myself. song. Okay, let me mute everyone for a second. Sorry about that. Okay. So thank you so much, Antonio. Uh, thank you for joining. Um, Adam? Please introduce yourself. Sure, happy to. Thanks for the invitation. Good to be here. Nice to see all of you. Adam Dakin. I'm a partner with Philadelphia-based venture fund called Dream Adventures. Uh, we're one of the most active early stage uh, health tech investors. Our targets are late seed through Series A. Uh, we can only invest in companies that are domiciled in either Israel or the U.S. Um, so that's just a, a heads up. Uh, what's really unique and different about our model is we connect our companies to a network of over 100 potential customers, uh, enterprise healthcare systems predominantly, lots of payers and health plans, and also a network of big pharma partners where we really get red carpet access to decision makers in those organizations because they know we are bringing them the best, the best early stage companies. And by way of background, I'm really an operator, 25 years of starting companies. I started five companies along the way, raised money for all of them. A couple did pretty well, a couple were abysmal failures, jury still out um, on the last one. And then I moved to the investment side uh, to lead Dreamit's Health Tech Vertical about, about five years ago. That's great. Thank you so much, Adam. Uh, Emily, are you there? Can you yeah, introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, okay, perfect. Can everyone hear me? Yes. 
Great. Well, great to meet you all and, and looking forward to hearing the pitches today. Um, I'm Emily Zen. I am an investor at NEA, New Enterprise Associates. We're one of the oldest and largest global venture and growth firms. Uh, we just announced our 18th fund last week, uh, about a $6.2 billion pool of capital, investing in healthcare and technology startups uh, and growth stage companies. So stage-wise, we do everything from company incubation, early stage venture, growth through public uh, investing. Um, and then in terms of my background, been at NEA for over three years. Um, prior was at uh, Goldman in the healthcare banking group. Prior to that, worked at a couple of digital health startups. Um, one actually that uh, went through Dreamit called Neuroflow uh, in the behavioral health space uh, and a healthcare infrastructure company called Healthy. Um, and then uh, started out uh, my career doing preclinical and clinical stage research. Uh, have a background in biology and business. Great to meet everyone. Great. Awesome. Thanks, Emily. And Matthew, could you please hey. go ahead? Yeah. Hey, guys. I'm Matt. I'm one of the senior program managers at Lead Sports and Health Tech Partners. So we're a VC based here in Berlin, but also in Orlando and Florida. So run um, accelerator programs and early stage investments. So I oversee the pre-seed bucket. Um, but we also have a seed fund, Series A fund, uh, growth equity fund, and an M&A advisory arm. So again, can support at really any stage of the journey. Um, my background, so I kind of came into the VC world a little bit differently. So um, graduated as a physiotherapist, went on, studied sports medicine, loved the data side. Berlin, six years ago, uh, still today, great health tech capital. So that's what, uh, that's what brought me over here. Um, also, also a girl who's now my wife, so that 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 worked out well too. So, um, <laughs> everything startup related works out really well in um, in Berlin. Um, went through the the incubator process myself, set up a company in 2019, um, RIP 2020. Uh, I'm sure that happened to a lot of people as well. But really excited to to uh, see and hear all the pitches. Hopefully, um, there'll be some support that I can or some of the other judges and advisors here uh, will be able to provide ad hoc afterwards as well. So uh, everyone looks super interesting. So excited. Great. Thanks so much, Matt. And um, Johannes. Yeah. Hey, everyone. And thanks for having me. I'm Johannes, a principal at Comstorm Ventures based from Vienna. Comstorm is still a young fund, uh, only started around three years ago. We focus very much on digital healthcare. And last year, we were the most active early stage health tech investor in Europe. We do around two investments per month. So super, super active. Pre-seed seed, everything from around 50K to 500K as a check. We usually don't do anything related to hardware, usually don't do biotech, uh, nor classical consumer goods. And I think what stands out for us is a little bit our appetite for, let's say, non-traditional investments, including everything uh, that is considered femtech, sexual health, or just taboo. Also, a lot of topics that are stigmatized and where it's probably hard to come forward with uh, in public including uh, obviously mental health as well. And other than that, um, maybe of myself, background on the one hand in consulting, worked at BCG based from Zurich for a few years and consulted big pharma and medtech companies. And before joining Comstorm, uh, worked at two other VCs, one of which is called Speed Invest, which is another Vienna headquartered fund. And the other one is called Oxford Sciences Enterprises, where we worked a little bit on the interface of academia and entrepreneurship, basically investing in PhDs, professors into health tech research, which was uh, also peculiar and, and super, super interesting. And yeah, excited about meeting all of the great people startups today. Great, thank you, Anna. So, uh, okay, then we can get started with our first pitch. Um, the first page is, as I said, um, Home Life 360. Harsh, are you there? I'm here. Okay, amazing. Um, can you introduce yourself and maybe share your screen as a representation? Yep. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, let me talk while I'm sharing. You'll have to enable screen sharing. 
I guess I just did. No. Okay. Um, why don't I just start my pitch? That includes my introduction anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, As you know, uh, you have seven minutes for presentation. Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Harsh Molik, and I am the CEO and founder of Humlife 360. Humlife 360 has come up with a simple and what we think is a very smart way of beating diabetes using nudging and motivation. The story of Humlife 360 starts with my own story. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I was diagnosed with diabetes type 2 about 10 years ago. Four years into my journey, everyone realized that my diabetes was uncontrollable. I wasn't able to manage it. Long story short, my mother and my wife decided to call me up almost every day and kept me motivated for that day to live slightly better, to be more active, to control my diet a little. Before you knew it, within 12 months, my A1C, my blood sugars were back to reasonable normal, normal range. My health was better. I had lost weight. And all it required was simple nudging and motivation. The point is, it wasn't I didn't have the information. I knew what to do. I knew how to manage diabetes. I had access to diets, to doctors, to medications. But their nudging motivated me to follow all of that. And it was so simple. So I decided I would do this for everybody. Um, for some, yeah. It turns out that lack of motivation was a huge problem. After spending $966 billion in 2021, 6.7 million people still died of diabetes related causes based on data from the IDF and our own analysis supported by external research. We estimate about 40% of these deaths could have been potentially avoided and 20% of the costs associated with that would have been potentially avoided if those people were able to live a little more diabetes friendly life. Like my mom and my wife did for me, we thought the solution is personalized motivation, but at scale. And that is what Humlife 360 does. We have an application, we have human support, and we deliver personalized motivation at scale. We use behavior science and AI to understand more accurately and faster the human mindset. We will use AI to deliver personalized nudges and motivation, and we use a whole spectrum of NLP <clears throat> functions and features, including conversational AI to enable chatbot interaction. Management team is me as the leader. Chad has 20 plus years of IT management experience. Jeff has two patents in analytics. Gene, who has degrees from MIT and CMU, has been working with behavior, human behavior for about 25 years. Bruce Masterson is our primary business and growth advisor with six startups and two exists to his credit. Aaron Turner has been working on artificial intelligence for the Department of Defense for more than 30 years. And Dr. Paresh Dandona, is the director of Western New York Endocr Endocrinology Diabetes Center with 10,000 plus diabetes patients uh, under his umbrella and he's, he's on our panel. So the market for what we call the smart nudge, once again, based on IDF uh, Atlas II data and our calculations, the TAM is 67 million people in a $71 billion market. The SAM is 16 million people with a $17 billion market. And focused on USA and India, we have somewhere around 6 million people as a SOM in a $7 billion market. And all the market valuations are based ground up. They're ground up calculations. These are people who would be first in line to really leverage our smart, nuts, smart nudging solution. We have competition, definitely. But from the perspective of what we bring to the table, extreme friendliness, extreme flexibility, the ability to be agile and align with an individual's persona on the one hand and on the other hand, a very economical. We can work under payer providers, direct to consumer, and we can scale globally. Uh, I think we are pretty much justified to be on the top corner up there. 
And one of the big differentiators is that we give comparable benefits and much better long-term benefits at a significantly lower. So our solution actually works. We have data for about 137 active users across nine months. We brought the A1C down by three points. We kept it down for seven months, which is the actual success criteria. We helped them develop new habits and we computed estimated cost savings across the board for about 20%. So these successes led us to make our first partnership with the companies. Kalina Health, based in <clears throat> New York, is headed by Dr. Parish Dandona, who is on our panel. He has 10,000 plus patients. His interest is cost savings. Arugya World is an NGO that operates in India. It has 1.5 million people with diabetes. Their interest is using our technology to track and monitor diabetes awareness. And Hexplora, that operates in Massachusetts and Connecticut, has about 100,000 patients under their umbrellas that work that fall under ACO. So in short, we have about 110,000 revenue customers and 1.5 million customers subject to us getting funded. We can start off with really the moment we get this. <clears throat> the funding will be required to hire and train people, our staff, move to a slightly more secure mobile technology than what we have today. And we will use a lot of those funds to automate to scale fast. Thank you. Questions, please. Um, uh, thanks so much, Arsh. Uh, yeah. All right. Yeah, I'll jump, jump in here. Good presentation, yeah, Arsh. Thanks. Um, really two questions. One, I guess maybe I missed it, but what evidence do you have or data? You know, I mean, I understand it worked for you, but do you have any data that this works across a population of patients? You know, any real prospective data and you may just be too early for that. So maybe you have a plan to get it. Um, and then part two, is there a technology layer in here somewhere? Uh, first part of your question, yes. So right now we have data for 150 people. Dr. Paresh Dandona, who's on our panel, has a plan for us to use his patients to come up with exactly what you're looking for using our solution across a population of about two or 3,000 customers. That's the answer to the first question. The second question, technology layer, yes. I'm obviously restrained by seven minutes, but we use a whole spectrum of technologies from actual behaviors, formal behavior science to artificial intelligence. Thank you, Adam. Um, Antonio, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Just one um, on the, you mentioned that you will save 20% of cost. Can you can you comment on that? Which kind of cost are you saving direct, indirect on the diabetes care? And, uh, and the second question, I also have a second one. Uh, who is going to pay for it? And this is, I might, I might have missed it. Sorry for that. Uh, no, I, I don't think you missed it. Even after the okay. So uh, we have just one example. Because it's a globally scalable SaaS company, the modes and methods and protocols of payment are going to be different from region to region. We've just taken one, and this is only an illustrative example based on information from the American Diabetes Association. The point is a $1,000 subscription to Humlife 360 has the potential of saving anywhere between three times to seven times of the claim costs for a typical insurance. So this is one example of how actually an insurance company will save money and those savings are then, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, realized. Now, when we have similar calculations for this that work on the employer side, uh, especially in the US. So those cost savings that the ones that we were able to calculate and the data that we had for a foundation of those calculations are basically US-based data. When we go to India, which is also a huge epicenter for diabetes, we have a different set of cost savings and those are slightly different numbers because a lot of that is going to be through the employers, but also direct to customers. And we will be happy to submit all of that information. Can you talk a little, the brief presentation, can you talk a little bit more about your Go to market and growth strategy. I know you mentioned you have about 150 patients that have used this, <clears throat> um, but what's your plan to kind of scale it up in terms of go to market? 
Thank you. That is an uh, amazing question. So um, right now we have a limited set of data. We want to take the next step, which is with these partners in mind who have seen the data, have examined the data and are willing to let us into their customers. So right now the go-to-market market strategy is to be with partners and uh, provide our services to their patients. So it is kind of so-called a captive audience that we have in mind. But after that, the next step after that, yes, we are primarily in now market to market in the US, we are primarily interested in B2B, uh, going to employers, insurance. Uh, we are actually negotiating even as we speak with certain uh, benefits brokers as well, which is again comes back to uh, working through employers. Um, in other regions of the world, especially in India, I think the emphasis at this moment or starting next year would be a little balance between B2B and going direct to customer using Thank you. Um, as I said previously, we do have data for that analysis and more than happy to submit that already. Great. So Matt, Johannes, sorry if you go ahead, yeah. Um, yeah, I'll jump in, uh, Johannes, if you don't mind. Um, so just to kind of go a little bit deeper on the B2B, B2C side and understand the customer journey and the onboarding, is this something that is available exclusively to patients within hospitals? So i.e. it's a fully medical, medical platform. Um, or how, how, are the, how are the users onboarded? And under what insurance codes have you actually researched or do you think that this platform is eligible for as well? Because there's some interesting um, there's some interesting things that have happened since COVID in the remote patient management um, era. So, but yeah, just those two questions, please. Thank you. Um, <laughs> amazing question. The first question, are we exclusively available only through a medical or an employer platform? No, we are not. It's a pure SaaS play. Uh, our marketing channels and delivery channels might be through employers and through payers, as the case may be for a specific region or a specific country. But the core solution is available off the shelf to anyone who wants to sign up at any, any point. In uh, number two, uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat the second question, please? So just from, it, it was, so number one, so I, I just assumed that you might have done additional research in the insurance space in the, in the US, but just to understand what would the insurances be covering here? So when the yes. doctor is working with it, what codes is he, is he working with from an insurance perspective? Beautiful. So this example that I've got here, uh, this is the beginning of our exploration into the world of insurance. And I have about two fellows from Dr. Dandona's office who's actually researching and coming up with those relevant codes. So I do not have those codes with me right now, but within yeah. a week or so, we will have those codes. That's exactly yeah. what we are looking for right now. Yeah, because if this is something that can kind of thin the patient load for the practitioners and for the, for the departments, um, it might be eligible for the remote patient monitor codes that have come up and cropped up since since um, since COVID kind of took over as well. So it's just a, I can, an area I can to look share, into. I can share one thing with you. Um, one of the things that Dr. D and his fellows are really concerned about is what they call reinsurance uh, rates, uh, re sorry, readmission rates. So those are KPIs, uh, re readmission rates is a big KPI for all of them. And that's one of the KPIs that they're just, just be mindful, Harsh. That's a great KPI, but it's incredibly hard to prove. You yes. need to do a very yes. long prospective study, probably randomized. Um, so going to take a lot of time and a lot of money to get proof points around lowering. Because as you know, there's so many variables that confound the readmission rates. Adam, and, and that is that is the exact reason why I did not like submit myself to any KPIs right now. And I said that Dr. D is actually doing some research on that. Yeah, you are absolutely correct. We are aware of that. Thanks, Harish. Uh, Johannes? Yeah, we'll probably need to ask Patu whether we have time for more questions. Yeah, yeah, we, we actually two, have two minutes left, yeah. Two minutes left, okay. Cheers. Yeah. 
maybe two questions or more one comment and and a question i think that the comment would be that i love to see a bit more use cases in terms of how would the, the customer journey really look like mm -hmm. end to end also to understand the pain points and you can comment about that as well and the question would be to me given that we, for example, invested in second nature, which is more on the weight loss side, but use similar dynamics. Um, some of our LPs are the My Sugar founders. I think that we're on your uh, competition matrix quite close to you. The, the question would be, what would you say is your, your secret ingredient? What is your, your main USP? And how do you differentiate, differentiate yourself out there? Uh, so the first question is obviously very simple to answer. We have about 17 case studies officially approved by Dr. D, Dr. Desai, and a couple of other doctors, which we presented at two uh, international diabetes conferences. I'd be happy to share that with you if you would like to see those. That's number one. Number two, our secret sauce. Uh, there are several, frankly speaking. Uh, it's a balance between what we will patent and what we will keep at a straight secret for a while. But one of the essential, uh, I feel, uh, one of the essential highlights of what we've done is our ability to combine behavior science and extract certain KPIs. It, the, the key is in what are the KPIs you are actually measuring from a human persona. And that provides us the ability to understand their mindset faster, and better, better in the faster is faster, literally faster. Better in the sense is life changes. When life changes, how do the KPI values change, and how that, how should that reflect on our recommendation engine? I think that is probably the biggest, the biggest secret sauce we have. Great, thanks. So, thank you, Harsh. Time is up. Uh, thank you, Judge, for all the questions and comments. And thank you, Harsh, for your presentation. Not at all. And Thank you, all of you. Thank you, absolutely. And um, the next page is Salotex. Itai um, will be presenting its CEO of the company. And he shared his screen already. So feel free to start when you're ready. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would start in describing last Wednesday. This is actually the second time, as far as we know, where personalized cannabis prescriptions was prescribed and prepared it, this was prescribed actually to two patients in Munich, prescribed by the doctor, Dr. Grisha. It, the prescriptions were sent to Bochum, which is over 600 kilometers away, to be prepared in the compounding facility and being dispensed directly to the patient's home. The patients, when receiving that, actually used through the app in order to enable the doctor to monitor their treatment. He can see their consumption and he can see the effects of that treatment. This is for us the 21st century medication. It's precise, it's personalized, and it's cost-effective. This is us and this is Celotex. This is actually the first prescription. And the problem that we are addressing is medical cannabis. Medical cannabis obviously is already a big market. It's over $10 billion at the moment. However, comparing to the number of disease that it might be applicable for, and the, the, the relevant word here is might be, this is where we see the potential. Cannabis is not customized at the moment. The doctor is not enabled to provide that treatment. And this is what Celotex is here to do. What we have developed, and this is where I'll pause to introduce myself. My name is Itai Segal. I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of Celotex. And we have developed uh, the medical cannabis cloud. The cloud actually connects the partners, which are the doctors, compounding facilities. It connects the patients, connects personalized products, and of course, the data generated out of that. In simple words, how do we do it? So the doctor prescribed a specific personalized cannabis prescription. As some of us are probably aware, cannabis is hundreds of different molecules, cannabinoids, terpenes, flavonoids, but eventually a prescription can be personalized. How it's being personalized? According to the patient treatment, cannabis can be used eh, for sleep, anxiety, pain, psychiatric disease, woman health, neurological issues, cancer, all of those have very specific symptoms to deal with. As of today, cannabis is not personalized. So in order to do so, you need a doctor to personalize and you need the ability to produce that. And I'll explain how we are actually doing it. The consumption is being consumed by existing devices 
or devices that we are introducing and eventually being monitored through, again, existing devices. We are not developing hardware whatsoever. So my Apple Watch or the Samsung or whatever other uh, mobile device can be used in order to conduct this monitoring. Eventually, what our platform provides is an AI-powered personalized insights to uh, enable the doctor to provide better treatment and to reiterate to optimize the treatment for the patient. Our first addressable market is Germany, as mentioned. Uh, the market size and the reason why we have chosen Germany is a progressive health insurance, and I'll refer to health insurance further in our presentation, supportive regulation, the ability to compound personalized products is actually quite unique in Germany, Switzerland to add to that, and several other European territories. This is why we are starting there. And we have already set up there our operational supply chain. As for a, the Celotex revenue, the Celotex revenue is actually quite simple. It's being generated out of Celotex prescriptions. Pharmacies are producing Celotex prescriptions, and in turn, Celotex has a markup over the products being sold. This provides us on a yearly average of just over 500 euros per patient. The opportunity in the compounding pharmacy, and this is actually very important. Obviously, traditional pharmaceutical companies are conducting clinical trials and in turn work in the method, which is one size fits all approach. Compounding facility, a micro one, actually enables personalization of the product. As mentioned, the two prescriptions were actually prepared according to the prescription. Having the ability to do that in scale, to deal with the logistic aspect, to deliver it directly to the patient on a, a next day delivery, this is where the timely manner of personalized medication should take place at. What we're actually building now in Germany is our network of doctors and pharmacies. Pharmacies to handle the compounding aspect, and as pharmacies can deliver, the scalability here is quite immediate. And the doctors is our focus at the moment, and I'll explain further on how we engage with the doctors. There is actually a great demand, and we, have, we are already engaging with several key opinion leaders in Germany. Part of that is the German Pain Association in order to start prescribing Celotex products. In comparison to the existing products in Germany, our ability to provide a much wider variety of products, which are ongoing, always the same one. This is where the doctors uh, actually see Celotex and, and are willing to prescribe. Our and I just like, to let you know, we have around two minutes left, just to let you know. Thank you for that. Uh, this is actually the most important slide in order to understand the big picture. We have doctors, more patients, more prescriptions, pharmacy income, and in turn, Celotex income. The Celotex income actually can be a, introduced back to the doctors who, to conduct observational studies. So this is where more research insights and products are generated. So alongside our business model, there is also the data capture and the data capture is being used to help the patients to achieve better treatment. And of course, future patients as those insights generated is actually part of the observational study that we are now initiating starting in Germany. Intellectual property, we have already filed our PCT, which is around closed loop drug administration. In very simple words, the ability to induce cannabis as the drug exposure and to assess the outcome of that. We're currently working on additional two provisionals as well. Competitors analysis, and we'll probably be asked about it. There are personalized products, and this is our key feature. As for the team, quite diversified. I won't uh, describe each and every one. Uh, I guess that the diversity that we have of medical doctors, technology, cannabis extract specialists, and of course, the scientific board is where uh, it's become is much more relevant and put us in a very unique position. We are initiating our seed round at the moment. It's $3.7 million. Uh, $1 million is already on soft commitment from our existing investors. And these are our goals, and I'm more than happy to describe further uh, as per your questions. Round A is planned once we'll have readiness for the next big market. Uh, we are working on opportunities on those three markets. Each and every one uh, is actually quite, quite big. USA, obviously, quite different. Uh, great. So, okay, we are also at time. Okay, great. Um, Johannes, I see you can raise your hand. You can start. Go ahead. 
Yeah, so first of all, um, congratulations, amazing pitch. It was really engaging and uh, I felt the excitement. So that was good. Um, yeah, a couple of questions maybe. So first, first one would be on the problem for someone who never been involved in this world. How big is the problem you're solving really? Like, is it rather nice to have or is it a huge issue? How much better will be the individualized product and how do you ensure that actually? And probably directly in relation to that, the second question with regards to the revenue, so understand you just take a, a percentage, is a commission from, from the pharmacy, usually or from the medical doctor. Um, so will the, will the spend for them be higher or will you cut a little bit of their profit margin? What's the, what's the sales hook there also to them on the B2B side? Okay, so two very good questions. I'll start off with the first one, which is the size of the problem. In order to demonstrate that, cannabis here in Israel is currently consumed mostly with flowers. Flowers by definition, and patients are actually discussing in strains. Strains is something which is constantly changing. Patients are constantly changing the strains in order to find the right one for them. When they do find, it will change next month because it will be a, a different batch of that strain. So this is the size of the problem. Cannabis as a medical aspect, it needs to be a repeatable drug suited for this specific patient. The side effects of cannabis, what we're seeing now with medical cannabis is just the tip of the iceberg. These are the early adopters. Once my grandma would adopt medical cannabis and our doctor would adopt medical cannabis as the first option, this is where we'll know cannabis had actually matured and the potential there was actually captured. It's currently not that. The numbers that we are seeing are really the early adopters. Patients are seeking for treatment, which their doctor are mostly reluctant to prescribe. So this is the magnitude of the problem at the moment. As for the spend, eh, I didn't go into that in more depth, but eh, discussing specifically about Germany, there is actually quite a, quite a big insurance reimbursement around medical cannabis. Eh, the German government had spent in 2019 over 160 million euros in reimbursement for medical cannabis, although it hadn't been proven. So it's being prescribed off label. This is a very important one. As for the revenue here and where does new revenue come in, and in Germany, there are 20,000 uh, pharmacies. We are going to work with only five. Uh, so this is where the potential for a pharmacy to have some of its markup uh, being diverted into Celotex is become more appealing from a business perspective. Keep in mind, a pharmacy in Germany actually has a 100% markup. He buys in X and sells in 2X. So this is where uh, the pharmacy are actually willing and wanting to work with Celotex. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Anas. Anyone else? Maybe An Antonio? Yeah. <clears throat> no, very nice speech. Uh, just wanna, I was wondering, and I'm, I'm sorry, maybe I'm not very familiar with the space, but um, besides having this closed loop using pharmacies, pharmacy and also doctor, you're also providing data back to the doctor to say if the treatment is well. Is that correct? Do I understand right? Okay. That's correct. And yeah. So on the data capture, what are you using? You mentioned you have no hardware, you can use any device, but how precise, how accurate is this measurement and how this affect also then, you know, the doctor adjusting the treatment and on, you know, I'm looking at the patient side, I'm not looking at the distribution, I'm not looking, this is pretty clear and you have an edge there, but also on, you know, giving a better cannabis treatment to a patient. So uh, if you can comment a bit on this side. Okay, so uh, as part of our approach, we like zero, zero traction. That means that we are not developing any hardware. We're actually connecting to existing hardware. Part of that is hardware, which is available already for the patient. So my Apple Watch, Google, Fitbit, whatever, we're actually already connected to. An, an additional segment of uh, devices that we are working with are actually medical devices. By being a medical device, it means, and it's part of our clinical trials readiness, we'll need to demonstrate that it's accurate enough in order to uh, base uh, medical recommendations on that. This is part of what we'll be doing in our clinical trials. At the moment, again, we are connecting to existing hardware, which is your mobile device, your wearable, 
just to mention diabetic, as it was actually mentioned here, and diabetic is relevant for medical cannabis. We are connected to Abbott freestyle stickers. I'm putting here, I'm pointing here because I'm actually wearing one. It's part of the data that we are capturing. Um, so that's in relation to, to the hardware. The doctor eventually receives the data, the patient views the data, and assuming the patient is sharing the data with the doctor, the patient, some of them prefer to keep it for themselves and it empowers them as the patient, some of them share with the data, and the ones that are conducting the observational studies are actually sharing that also with the Celotex cloud. I see, and maybe if, if I can briefly follow up, can you use something that is not wearable? Can you use your phone to measure any biometrics or so? Definitely. So a lot of companies are doing that at the moment. Everything that starts from eye tracking to skin tone, pupil size, you name it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, cool. Thanks, uh, Itay. That was a really, really good pitch. Um, also agree that there's crazy, there's crazy things you can do with data capture um, now at the moment. Definitely there. Um, I'm, 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 I'm quite, quite impressed. Um, it, it's really interesting. I'm working um, with a lot of founders in the U.S. on this, and there's a lot of movement in the U.S. not only on cannabis but also in psilocybin as well. I think, um, I think Oregon have legalized psilocybin as a prescriptive medic medication as well just last week. So I definitely think there's a shift in cons consumer behavior or maybe patient behavior, but that's kind of where my question is, is leading to. So from the cohort of patients that you've been working for and also the cohort of doctors that you've been working with, how scalable do you see their perceptions or stigmas towards cannabis as a pharmaceutical derived kind of um, medication, if, if that question makes sense. It, it makes perfect sense. I hadn't uh, discussed our go-to-market, but actually doctors divide into two groups, the one that have actually seen cannabis works and the mm -hmm. ones that didn't. The ones that didn't, probably not big cannabis believers. If you'll approach them, they'll probably say, I'm, I'm not a dealer, go to another doctor. We are obviously working with the first group. After the clinical trials, we will be able to address the the second group as well, the non-believers. At the moment, we are engaging solely with doctors who are cannabis believers. As for your comment on psilocybin, just discussing our roadmap, cannabis is just the first one. Plant yeah. medicine, in order to introduce that, this such platform as Celotex, this is what will be needed in order to prove, meaning people consuming something, being able to demonstrate in real life, not necessarily in clinical trials, which are limited to tens, hundreds of people, but in real life to show real results, this is what we are here to do. Yeah. And just quickly then, so on the pharmacies, you said you're working with five. How many pharmacies have you predicted in your financial model to work with before you reach profitability? Okay. So as for the pharmacies, we are aiming for five currently. Aiming for with, five, yeah. Currently with two. But okay. just but just to uh, mention the second one, they already have the ability to deliver throughout Germany. So we could have been satisfied with just those two in order to provide the patients with uh, the ability actually to choose and in order to cover more geographical locations to have more prompt deliveries. This is why we are scaling up to five. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. We have actually just less than a minute. So maybe just one more question from Adam or Emily. Yeah. Small comment yeah, or question. Great, great presentation. Uh, my question is just around if you could describe more details on the clinical study um, that you plan to do and specifically the outcomes. Uh, we talked about uh, the doctors that are believers and the doctors that aren't. How do you, like, what kind of outcomes data do you need to show them to convert the non believers to believers? Okay, so as for the clinical trial, very small and very short answer for short that answer. actually. Okay. Yeah. In, in bullet points, clinical trial being filed in Malta, being scaled to other European territories according to the recent legislation, he, working with a professor who is conducting medical trials and clinical trials for the FDA, and also working with the CEO authorities, and he is our guidance through the loophole of clinical trials in order to prove them as successful. One last bullet, just earlier this week, we have met with a very interesting company who is conducting the same thing in the US 
and they're actually looking to cooperate with us. Yeah, great. Thank you, Utay. Thank you for the great presentation and great answers. Um, and yeah, thank you. So we can thank move to the next pitch. Thank you, Hydrohex. Um, Tommy will be presenting the, uh, the opportunity. Tommy, are you there? Yes, yes. Good evening. I'll just share Good my evening. screen. Just yes. a second. Uh, can you see it right now? Yes. Right. All right. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Good evening. My name is Tommy Vallenius and I'm the CEO of Hydrohax and we are a digital fitness company serving people in, in swimming pools. Problem we're addressing is the shortage of sports instructors in public swimming pools. Pool managers, they are facing high maintenance costs, especially with current surging energy prices. And this creates huge pressure for managers to increase occupancy rates and member retention, which is challenging for them if the only thing they can offer to consumers is the empty pool without any classes or courses. And, and that's why we exist. We help managers to complement and substitute the need of instructor with virtual fitness and swim-related educational content. We have achieved fairly good traction both in domestic Finnish market and in neighbor of Swedish markets. And recently we have also launched first seven sites in the UK, resulting in total 110 subscribing clients. They are very satisfied with our offering, yielding relatively high 115% annual net revenue retention and NPS of 71. Uh, we have quite strong bottom-up market potential case here for both virtual aquatic fitness classes and virtual swim education materials supporting swim teachers' job. By multiplying our annual recurring revenue per product with the number of public pools in the biggest European countries in the US, we can speak about 1 billion euros market potential. Additionally, we see that safety-related content and virtual coaching services for lab swimmers will at least double the total market potential in these geographic areas in the future. Key question is naturally that what percentage of market is servable and, and what is our future target market share? To reflect a bit, we've been on the Finnish market for around three years now, and we have learned that around 70 to 80% of public pools are servable, and we have achieved 30% market share in here. Next few words about how we operate. Firstly, we produce the content ourselves to ensure top tier quality and immersive fitness experiences for consumers. And additionally, we have built a media player system, allowing us to serve the pool managers and consumers needs. Uh, in case the client doesn't have a pre-existing screen, uh, we'll help them to set up a screen by partnering with local screen vendors. Now we charge 1000 euro account opening fee covering the cost of the mini PC that is shipped to the client. Uh, the annual license depends on the chosen content packages and it varies from 4000 euros up to 15,000 euros uh, right now. Average is 6K, and, and with that one, the ratio of lifetime value and customer acquisition cost is well above four right now. The market segment we're entering is almost empty. On the one hand, there are plenty of businesses offering either instructors or equipment for public pools. On the other hand, there are also plenty of businesses selling swimming and aquatic fitness content directly to consumers. But we have recognized only two other companies globally serving consumers digitally through screen in public pools, leisure centers, and health clubs. And then we see that the big consumer masses are swimming actually there, and they do, do need service and contact point in there. As a first mover, we have already built certain capabilities, including systems to produce cinematic aquatic fitness and swimming content, as well as the tech platform to display the content. And, and thus, there are already some replacement costs um, for later movers entering the stage. The next move is systematically designed the service to increase customer switching costs. Firstly, we are iterating the best ways to embed the pool managers uh, weekly fitness class programming into our system. And, and the more their thinking and data relies to our system, the higher the switching cost becomes. Secondly, the more swim instructors configure the content uh, they need during their classes, the more embedded uh, to our system they're actually, they will become as well. We see that much stronger competitive advantages can be built with the help of consumers. Um, network e economics effects might start to play a significant role later when the installed base grows significantly. Uh, firstly, uh, consumers engage with hydro exporting activities by the pools. And, and the more we have them, the more valuable the installed base of the screen becomes, for instance, for those who are willing to sell swimming related merchandise to consumers. 
And if we achieve this kind of platform thinking, it would actually turn the B2B business to two-sided platform between consumers and swimming merchandise consumer brands. Secondly, our goal is definitely to connect with the consumers working out with us and, and with these hydro hexers, if we can enhance their tendency to form local strong tribes of like-minded people in the pools, uh, we see there are big opportunities to start building a strong consumer brand in long-term perspective. But yeah, back to present, uh, 2023 should be the last year with negative free cash flow before reaching the first single period break even for the company. Uh, we will hit in around 1 million euro annual recurring revenue, the break even point where we can actually cover our fixed costs for operating the business. And after that, a strong unit economics should enable us profitable sales acceleration, at least at the annual growth rate of 60%. Go to market strategies is currently focused 30% of the pools with the best match and, and value potential with direct B2B sales. In Sweden, we have currently 30 paying clients and we think we are crossing the chasm to reach early majority market soon in there. In the UK, we are still working with early adopters to secure a strong reference base before it actually makes sense to start accelerating customer acquisition in, in 2024. In our home market, we have already reached 30% of the market. And in here, the focus is mostly on introducing new content lines to boost revenues. And that, that's actually the trick to scaling revenues faster in because the total number of public pools is quite static. And, and, and thus, we need to find ways to increase the value per site. We have already recognized plenty of opportunities and, 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 and by developing additional content lines will most likely turn the current somewhat arithmetic growth to geometric, geometric growth model. We have a strong team. There is a mix of sports, business and tech in here. And, and we are also backed by Finnish VC Gorilla Capital with a few uh, exited entrepreneurs and angel investors as well. We have quite clear for the following 18 months. Firstly, our goal is to reach well profitability and furthermore, it will be essential to build the minimum customer facing team in the UK market before actually starting to scale up in there. Secondly, um, we have a good early traction for the uh, swim instructor tool here in the Nordics and we are trying to implement that largely to our uh, existing customer portfolio. And thirdly, as I mentioned, the consumers are definitely the key in long term for, for strong position and, and much bigger value and we will start iterating with them as well. As I said, we are uh, having quite clear goals and we are raising late seed fund right now. We have soft commitments from our existing investors and I'm looking for one or more investors to join us this time. I think I'm quite close to seven minutes. Yes. Yeah, that's it. limit. So I'll, I'll stop speaking right now. I'm looking forward to answer questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tommy. Uh, Adam, would you like to start this time as we didn't get a chance to take your comments on the previous one? If you're there, yeah. Yeah, I'm here. Um, yeah, this is really outside of scope for, for our fund. So I'm not sure I bring a, a lot of expertise here. Um, but can you provide maybe if, if you think about scaling in the US market, what the go to market is here? I would maybe actually see acquisitions as the fastest way. There are like loads of um, very traditional fitness instructor businesses that might be serving tens or, or, or maybe even hundreds of, of pools. At least here in Europe, we recognize these kind of players, but they're very undigitized. So that might actually provide kind of a speedway to start getting clients fast, basically by digitalizing. We would get very good instructors that we film, and then we would digitalize their existing client base of pools. That's one idea. Uh, don't know yet, market potential is big in there, but we've been quite focused in UK and Nordic so far. So I haven't studied US that much yet. Gotcha. Uh, if I understood correctly, you live in there. So, uh, well, it's swimming, I guess it's quite a big thing, but what are like the market dynamics uh, mostly? Where would you go for a swim, for instance? Yeah, I, I don't have a lot of expertise here. We, we don't play in the fitness industry. I mean, you know, I imagine it's somewhat geographic you know, outdoor versus indoors, that kind of thing. Um, you know, there's a lot of larger fitness organizations that have pools, the YMCAs, the LA fitnesses, you know, these larger fitness clubs that have swimming pools, but I don't know what they offer in terms of, you know, exercise programs. Yeah, I'm indeed. Well, I said plenty, plenty of things to study for us regarding US, but yeah, thanks. 
Yeah, thank you, Adam. Anyone else? Maybe Matt? Um, sure. I, I, I work with a swim tech company in the in the US um, called, called Flex. But one question I have is, are, are you able to capture any fitness uh, data or exercise related data from everyone participating um, in these in these interactive or in, in, in the classes in the pool? Yeah, that's the thing we are struggling right now. We are most mostly doing broadcasting from a big screen. Mm -hmm. uh, that's definitely a future goal to to start connecting with consumers. I do see wearables as the best uh, existing devices there. Uh, it not, might not be the most important thing to do during this year, but definitely later on, it will be very important to connect wearables, especially smartwatches, Apple watches, with the experience and provide the plus one element for the for the actual workout session. Yeah, I th I think that'd be interesting because. Um... There's a company out of Berlin called Beat 81 that does something like that. You can see your heart rate. You can see different things to make um, or to push yourself during the workout, I guess. Um, and it's proven or they, they found that it increases engagement during, during everything. But um, yeah, and I even think with Germany, Berlin in particular, lots of public public pools that cost like five euros during the summer to go in, to relax in, to maybe have a fitness class in. Um, partnering with different different providers like um, like decentralized kind of gym providers and um, can't think of the name of it because it's a just just a little bit late after a long day but also from the US perspective it's it's very easy to think of the amount of swimming pools um, there, there's a lot of public pools actually in the US I think about 60 or 70 percent if I can remember my stats right and then you can also target either country clubs with more premium offerings or if it's public and a different direction there. So lo lots of food for thought. Um, yeah, really impressed with the presentation and um, impressed with the financials, but I'll hand it over to, to someone else because I talk a lot. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Thanks so much for your contribution, Matt. Antonio, yeah, feel free to go ahead. I just want to continue and follow up on what, uh, what Matt was discussing because, you know, this is also out of scope for me, but. Um, I've been teaching in swimming and I've been, uh, you know, been uh, taught by other people when I was a child. And uh, I think this wearable component is quite interesting because when I imagine something like this, you know, as a customer of a swimming pool, I will go to, to not only move and do some exercise, but also to, to be taught and to be shown how to really do it in the proper way. You know, and according to from what I understand, this is not a service that you are providing yet. Of course, the, the problem that you are tackling is big and is obvious. I mean, there is a lack of these teachers, but, um, you know, people don't only go to do exercise to move. And also because you want to improve your techniques and you want to go better. I'm thinking more on swimming than maybe, let's say, aqua gym or this kind of stuff, which you want to measure how the, 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 the customer or the swimmer are, are doing it which this will be a good add-on of solution you're providing. Yeah, def definitely. I, I think it should be a combination of a wearable and a proper screen. They need the demonstration, the correct example, the inspiration, what you should try to reach for. But then we will need a way to actually measure whether you are doing it in the right way. They're actually very interesting companies also um, implementing AI into like Lifesavers help that they actually track the whole pool with cameras. There's also one option to see uh, how people actually swim, do they improve? So, so it might be either wearables with motion sensors that you can get the data, are you improving your swimming or not? Or then actually with the cameras, security cameras that are anyways needed in there. So yeah, definitely very interesting future opportunities while the tech develops. As a suggestion, maybe uh, you should look into the VR space for healthcare. There is a lot of these uh, measuring body movement for, you know, exercise and also to see if you're doing good things you know they're used for many things like pain management and other stuff that will be a good place where you you could be inspired yeah thanks for a good tip thank you antonio uh, johannes or emily do you have anything to ask or make a comment um yeah, maybe maybe a comment because i'm realizing we will only have a few minutes at the end to wrap up and so far we've mainly asked questions so uh, i'm thinking uh, a couple of pointers with regards to 
to feedback. Um, and, and thanks again for the for the great presentation. Um, and this is more general, not with regards to to that one, but for example, something like the the team slide. I personally love to see at the almost the very beginning, because particularly as we're investing in pre seed seed stages, you really end up investing in in the founder and probably the founder markets fit and see how well positioned are the founders to disrupt this market and also picking up on that then it probably also makes sense to put less emphasis for example on the advisors but really um, try to explain why the founders are exceptional and an exceptional fit for this given market um, another kind of pointer would probably be to show less or for example at least for me given that we even often invest in pre-revenue, sometimes pre-product to show a bit less of the projections because obviously they're going to be uh, insanely um, huge and we usually um, don't don't look at that too much, at least not in the, in the first call. That might be interesting a little later on. And um, the last thing is probably which I actually liked in this presentation, but also more of a, a general point is to really show use cases because for VCs, we're uh, often not the smartest people, not the most um, in the topic. And then it really makes sense to show the use cases. So um, they really understand it. And lastly, maybe um, kind of being a hypocrite on that, but also taking feedback from VCs um, and advice on that would be to probably ignore it up until to a certain, let's say, number of data points, because quite often there will be um, a discrepancy between what they tell you and what they actually mean. And probably only after 20 plus or something that are consistent, then it will really mean something. Because imagine uh, also you're a VC, you give some feedback to a founder to change something founder comes back and then it would probably even make you suspicious you're like, okay why is the, the founder changing something right away it's not too much conviction so it's that but then also bearing in mind that vcs don't know a lot usually in the field but know just a lot or just enough to be dangerous to have a strong opinion which um probably should be also taken to, into account sorry for speaking a little long but probably over time yeah, no worries. Thank you. Thanks so much, Johannes. We're also now, right now, just exited the time. But Tommy, do you have any comment on that, or maybe any final words before we go into the next page? Yeah, I think that's up. I'll have plenty of notes here. Thanks, uh, Matt. If I can reach you later to ask the specific name you mentioned, you weren't sure about that one, so that might be very valuable. Yeah. But yeah, sure. Let's connect offline. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much, Tommy. Thank you. Evening. And the next page is Enhanced Day. Uh, Federico Fontano, CEO and co founder, will be presenting it. Federico, uh, you can share a screen and start, start the presentation. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Fede. My name is Fede, and I'm the CEO of Enhanced. And Enhanced is the single digital hub for diabetes self management. Uh, Marta is a young girl. Uh, she's a friend of mine, uh, Marta Cremonese, and she has diabetes. Before I met Marta, my knowledge about diabetes was fairly limited. I thought that people living with this condition has to avoid sugar at any cost and inject with insulin a bunch of times per day, as simple as that. However, dealing with diabetes is an everyday challenge, and these individuals have to constantly think about keeping their sugar level under control to avoid major and dangerous health consequences. I saw Marta last summer at a wedding and she was telling me uh, because di diabetes technology helps in dealing with this condition, she decided to follow a macro shift in the way diabetes is managed today, adopting all the latest technology available in the space. However, after just a couple of months rely on this technology, Marta felt overwhelmed by the amount of data she had to interpret, almost frustrated by the experience. 
And until recently, the only way to uh, keep track of your diabetes was through simple pen and paper, uh, recording your blood glucose concentration and trying to make a uh, sense of the, of the data and all the choices from these numbers uh, manually. Today, we are seeing a rapid rise in technology aiming to help uh, manage diabetes. And perhaps the most impactful of this technology is CGM, Continuous Glucose uh, Monitor. And this is a very powerful technology nowadays that allows individuals to measure their data in real time. And you may have seen uh, people wearing these devices on their arms. So compared to pen and paper, as I said, CGM is very powerful. Uh, you can see your glucose data in real time on your phone and go through it retrospectively with your doctor. However, the data generated by these devices is almost overwhelming and also very clinical. If you look at the standard ways of reporting CGM data, and you can see up the screen an example. For Marta, she needs to cope and contend with this much data every day. And she has to make quick and very important decisions that have a huge impact on her health. And the reality is that even Marta's doctor struggle in understanding this data. And Marta feels that she's losing control despite having uh, more data. Uh, the old way of looking at diabetes information was very similar to the way we were used to predict the weather. In the past, the only way to forecast your weather was to look out the window, understanding the color of a cloud, and perhaps plan your day out of that information. Today, thanks to the advancement in weather forecasting technology, we are able to predict the weather with incredible accuracy. And with weather forecasting like diabetes, it's possible to create huge layers of very complex and fancy graphs. But interpreting this, pan, this, this data is very complex and takes a lot of skill and expertise. And the weather is a good example of how you can make data as complex as you want. Then Apple came in 2004 with a revolutionary solution, the Weather App. The Weather App is a simple and easy to use platform that shows the user uh, the weather in less than a second. In, in just one click, the opening click, uh, you can understand the weather forecast for planning your day. It's easy and doesn't rely on any skill, neither on talking about the language because it's a universal symbology. So what if we can make the diabetes self-management experience as easy as checking the weather with our digital solutions? Always in your pocket, in one click, and always actionable. And this is our vision, a digital ecosystem capable of displaying diabetes data at a glance. This is enhanced. So Marta, of course, today can uh, rely on different solutions to help her making sense of all the data she collects each day. On one side, we have the industry leaders. However, they are not interested in a standardized solution because they are pushing their own hardwares. They want to differentiate in silos approaches. And for Marta, it's very difficult to integrate with many devices that she is using around her diabetes. And if she wants to switch to a different diabetes technology, it's very cumbersome to relearn the whole digital experience. On the other side of the competitive landscape, Marta can rely on alternative solutions. However, there is a tendency to focus on either the patients or the doctor. So for Marta, it's very difficult to coordinate her efforts with his doctor, with her doctor. We here we want to offer Marta a different solution, um, a fully interoperable, standardized and integral solution, because we want to make her life easier, not harder. And we want to create a platform that also does not look and feel very clinical and judgmental. We are a team of four co-founders, and over the last 10 years, we've been experiencing diabetes from the clinical and research side to the technology side. And we have collectively more than 25 years of experience in diabetes. We have a strong scientific background, and we also have experience in the consumer tech health industry and in building and launching digital solutions. Marta is not alone today. Diabetes is one of the most and fastest growing conditions. There are millions of people like Marta that need to manage their sugar level every day, multiple times a day for the rest of their life. And millions of people are adopting new technologies to improve self-management. And there is a global trend of putting hardware at the core of diabetes management, but now it's time to put software at the core of diabetes management. That's why we plan to operate with a monthly subscription model where patients pay for the service 2.5 Swiss francs per month per user for our dashboard solution and 9.9 .9 Swiss francs per month per user for our app solution. And we project a yearly revenue in 2027 of approximately 40 million Swiss francs.
We are now uh, focusing. Sorry to interrupt. We have about a minute. Just to let you know, we have Thank about a minute. So yeah. Thank you. We are uh, today focusing heavily on product development. We are pre-launch, but we plan to put our beta of the desktop version in the market in three weeks from now, and our MVP of the desktop in May this year. We are also planning to launch our app solution in uh, Q2 next year. And we are currently rising 1.2 million Swiss francs in a pre-seed to cover operations for the next 18 months. And the use of funds will be mainly targeting key hires especially in the technology development and marketing and sales, also to cover some expenses related to uh, the launch of our system and to setting up uh, trials to open up reimbursement pathways. So I thank you for your time and I now look forward to open a uh, discussion and I hope you can embrace with us the challenge of enhancing the way diabetes is self-managed today. Great, thanks so much, Feda. Um... Anyone wants to start? Maybe Emily would you like to start with your comments, yeah. question. Or someone else? Yeah, I could take the first one. A good presentation. Good presentation, Federico. A couple of questions here. One, um, maybe you can drill down on the actual problem that you're solving. I get that this is not a today, it's not a good user experience. Um, you know, it's not good for the patient. But I'm not crystal clear on what clinical problem you're solving. Is it you know, because this better adherence, better control of diabetes, what's the what's the clinical problem you are solving and how will you prove that you solve that problem? Yeah, I think we need to look at the overall trend and the way diabetes is going to be managed in the future. I mean, diabetes is going to become a data-driven condition uh, thanks to tech like CGM, as I said, but also insulin pumps and all the wearables that can track life of a person living with diabetes, uh, these people will be um, kind of overflowed by data as, as Marta has, has her experience. And the problem is that your clinical outcome, the way you control your own diabetes will rely on your capacity to access and to make sense of all this information. And the main issue we have is that we assume that data literacy is quite high, but that's not true. Even on the doctor side, for a clinician to make sense of a person's data in a very quick way, because there is a massive shortage of clinicians, as you might know in, in the US especially, uh, they need a very quick solution to make very quick decisions. So clinical outcome, of course, is what we are going after for the patient side. On the clinician side is about the capacity to be productive um, and to, 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 to make sense of patient data much more quickly than what is happening today. On the... Um, how, how to gain validity, uh, of course, um, the, 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 uh, we received some, some grants to initiate some trials uh, related to how to make this solution accessible, um, mostly on the UX and UI, but that will prove how a patient can adopt the system and also retain on the system in the future. And that's um, one of the major lacking point in the moment. The experience you have when you try to make sense of your data is very clinical, very judgmental, not coming from a consumer tech space, but coming from a very medical tech space. And um, another point of like frustration is uh, today, uh, uh, the average clinician has to use multiple systems to make sense, to make sense of the multiple devices available out, out there. Um, we want to create a single solution that can integrate with everyone out there. So. Uh, a user or a customer can rely on a single digital space to make sense of anything that the patient is using. Hope I addressed your question, Adam. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's an assumption that I think, you'll, you know, the fact that you're giving better data, easier to interpret data to patients, there's an assumption there that they will manage themselves better. And I think that's a big assumption, um, particularly in diabetes where you know, a lot of controlling diabetes re relates to lifestyle and diet. And it's not like these patients don't know what they need to do or they haven't been told by their doctors or their family members how to improve their lifestyle or get their blood sugar in control. But, you know, changing human behavior, especially changing diets, incredibly hard. So yeah. Yeah, I think you need to prove that, okay, you gave me better data. It was easier. It was more interpretable. But is that really going to motivate me to engage in better behavior that actually reduces my blood sugar and controls my diabetes. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely good point. And one of the, um, the, the key aspect is also helping patients recognizing patterns in the way diabetes is like managed. Um, we want to be a bridge between problems in diabetes management and the causes of these problems. Today is very difficult to map human behaviors in current digital solutions. So integration is very hard and we want to make it very easy. So embedding all the possible data from wearables as well, activity trackers, lead monitors, uh, in an overlay of information to recognize patterns and inform uh, better behavior uh, based on data. Cool. I'll, I'll jump in super quick. Um, one comment that's interesting, I, 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 quite, I quite like what you've created. I, I have seen, especially in the, let's call it the wellness space or the prosumer market rather than the health tech market where the increased uh, or improved UX UI is, is it can be a sustainable competitive advantage but I think to to base or to work on the, the, the assumptions as well it could be interesting to to remarket potentially what you have for a performance market or just for a, a general wellness market because with regards to Glucose, yes, it's about management for, for patients with diabetes, but in terms of sport and um, performance as well, it's about maintaining that eugoslemia, the, 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 the maintenance of the, the glucose level at certain ranges. And then also in certain, I know from um, mental framing and mental wellness perspective, some people who do not have diabetes can also have um, increased um, increased sugar levels, which leads to, you know, feeling um, feeling different ways as well. So the, I'm, not, I'm not as familiar with that area, but there's a lot of potential. Um, and then just the quick question would be, how, how are you capturing the, the, the different data points or how have you thought about it? Yeah, um, yeah, good point. Uh, we are, I mean, CGM data, for example, belongs to the patient. So today is, mm -hmm. is possible to access CGM data from um, APIs, open APIs, but also we are working with aggregators, data aggregators that give us access to these data. Um, and for wearables, it works the same. We currently already integrate with Garmin, TrainingPeaks, Aura, uh, Strava. Uh, these are available data. Uh, that you can easily embed into your data streams. Yeah, cool. Uh, two interesting companies to, to look up from that point. One would be, there's a glucose monitor that's non-invasive um, called SM24. And then there's an SDK company called areyouonpoint.co as well. That could actually open up a lot more on the medical side, uh, the medical um, CGMs as well. I can send them to you afterwards. Yeah, thank, thanks. Thanks for having sticking note, but yeah, that, that's, cool. that, that's good. Yeah, they, these are very you know, potential opportunities. Uh, I, I just wonder about the, the strength of the evidences um, about the, the, the importance of monitoring glucose in these populations outside of the diabetes and pre-diabetes yeah. space. At the moment, it's not very clear, uh, but I agree in the future, there might be a lot of potential where and when scientific evidences will like, emerge. Yeah, thank you, Matt and Fada. Um, anyone else? Antonio or Johannes? I mean, I'm not an expert in the field, but I, I, do, I do like the, 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 the solution. And it was also a nice presentation. I'm wondering, I mean, you partially, Federico, already answered to Matt before, uh, the, the big the big players on the market are pushing for uh, um, better hardware that are able to do more things right not only glucose but also and the, 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 this this field is moving also quite fast and uh, how are you gonna be able to integrate all these data that, that are coming in a very efficient way and also clinical relevant uh, okay. what are the actionable let's say the, the to do things that a solution like this will induce to a patient. And these are not clear to me. And coming back probably to the other point of uh, at the beginning of the discussion. And uh, but this is something that, uh, that you should ask yourself and uh, you know, 
but I do like the fact that you are, uh, this is a patient centric and you're facing on, on a user uh, kind of uh, way to solve the problem. So I, I do like the solution. I still, I still have to wrap my head around uh, what is the best benefit for the patient. Mm -hmm. no, thanks for, for the input. Um, yeah, in integration is a key unlock in, in the space. If you try to use one of the uh, big company solution, it's, it's, it's really difficult to integrate something simple as exercise, as physical activity, for example, because it's not their interest. They are pushing, as you said, their own hardware, and they want to differentiate for, from the other players. Uh, so they are not interested in creating this common ground and standard language that we are pushing here. But this is what a patient needs. You might want to switch your CGM because you think that, or you have evidences that a competitor is better. So you want to move to a new solution, a different solution, but you need to relearn how to use their platform because it's very different. Um, so here we are, as I said, creating really a common ground and a common language uh, and a standardized approach as well through scientific validation in terms of what do we display uh, we are using, uh, for example, validated data displays. Uh, like sorry to interrupt, Peter. Actually, right. time is up right now, but do we have any final words? Then we can move to the next pitch. If we have final words, I want to give the chance to you, actually. Yeah, no, no, that, 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 that's fine. We can we can take you offline. Uh, I, thanks for the input. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for your presentation. And yeah, thank you. Very good evening. Yeah, let's move to the next pitch. Um, next pitch is Sayin, um, Rico Williams, CEO of the company, the little presentation. Rico, feel free to share your screen and make your presentation. I see the screen, right. but I can't hear you. Yeah, okay. Am I coming through now? Yes. Perfect. All right, well, um, good morning, everyone. I just need to move this out of the way. Um, but um, yeah, thanks for the awesome introduction. And hopefully it's not too confusing um, coming right after Frederico, but my name is Rico and I am the founder and CEO of SAN Corporation. We are based here in Seattle, Washington. Um, and before getting started, I just wanna thank everyone for coming today and gracing our company with this amazing opportunity. And I want to begin in a bit of an unconventional manner by posing a question. And I want you to imagine for a second, um, you can close your eyes if you have to, but I want you to imagine coming home after a long day at work and your wife or your husband or your child is home before you. They are visibly distraught and they approach you and tell you that they're depressed, they feel hopeless, and they're even having suicidal thoughts. What do you do and what is your next step? What is your first step? Perhaps the story hits close to home, um, perhaps not. Um, but unfortunately, this is the reality for many people across the world um, where this exact scenario plays out every single day. And unlike a broken ankle or a fever, we are generally woefully unprepared um, and unequipped to deal with these issues. And that's where our app saying comes in. I, along with my team, um, Kara Marie Lucas, Alan Yahic, um, Monica Williams, and Adi Yahic, um, we come to deliver the service where we believe, where we want to, to solve that problem. And we, we achieve so by multiple different services that we split up into two, core experiences on our platform. The first being for the free users. These are people who are seeking treatment and who um, are suffering from uh, mental or behavioral issues. And the other experience is solely for the mental and behavioral healthcare providers um, that are on our platform for networking purposes to um, garner and gain new customers or to improve their practice. So the first um, service that we offer is SAN Reviews. This is our main data engine or uh, data, source of data to feed into our data engine. And we use it to generate a final grade for each um, 
company, whether or not they are on our platform, we all we have over 1.3 million uh, data points across the United States for therapists, social workers, um, behavioral health um, cl uh, clinics, as well as hospitals. And this generates um, profiles for users, as well as these, um, as well as our healthcare providers to create a best match therapy for um, communities as well as users. Next up, we have um, SAN Community. This is our free social media aspect of the application where people can go to um, start their behavioral mental health journey before actually um, eliciting or soliciting the um, services on the platform or the, the best way to view community is if you are struggling with getting the nerve or the um, conviction to go to therapy, this gives you an avenue to talk to people in similar situations as yourself. Maybe you're a veteran, maybe you're a, a single mom or suffering from um, uh, postpartum depression. You can find people near you or across the globe that are suffering from the same things that you are and have seen the success of going to therapy or, or trying new methods of treatment like EMDR, if you're suffering from um, PTSD, for an example. And we think creating this um, full breadth approach will not only prove um, to be more impactful, but also lead to better outcomes for businesses as well as um, uh, patients. So services continued. We also offer a marketplace. This is a way for mental health facilities that suffer from um, large influxes of strain on their resources to leverage. Um, we, we have two, two minutes left, Rico, just to let you know. Okay, all right. Well, these are the other services. We have SAN BD, which is the business development uh, portion of our platform. We also have SAN surveys. This is another key way that we ingest a lot of um, data into our application. All of this, as well as saying communities, is a way to create a more holistic um, view of each person so that when a new user comes on board with just very minimal information that we glean from the registration form, we can immediately offer suggestions for the services that we think suit them best so they don't have to go through the trials and tribulations of finding therapy for themselves or for their loved ones. Um, here are some some screenshots from our application as well as our design and just skipping through here in lieu of time. We have done a, a considerable amount of market research and I think that is what truly sets our team apart is we have conducted tens of dozens of interviews with industry professionals to construct this application. Before writing a single line of code, we, we did all of the research necessary to create a holistic approach. And we have continued to do so for the past two years um, since the app has been in development. And this is uh, a bit of the market valuation where we wanted to validate that we can be profitable from this uh, process. And just to quickly go to the pricing structure, we want to offset the, the burden of revenue from patients seeking treatment to the providers. And we think by doing so, we create a platform that is more cohesive and creates um, an experience where providers want to be there. So we can develop services um, that help them provide better services to the patients and clients that they're serving. And yeah, um, at the time is uh, okay. Okay, right. yeah, that's fine. All right, well, any questions? I'm sure there are, there are a lot. I... <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the presentation, Rico. Um, yeah, of course. So who wants to start? Maybe Johannes, would you like to start? Yeah, happy to start. Um, yeah, really, 
really nice voice, super nice to listen to. This is the kind of voice I want to to listen to podcasts and and even books, this kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, very calm. Uh, that's that's appreciated. Loved also the um, start, which is unconventional, but um, uh, it worked for me. It definitely um, got my attention. Um, with regards to the product, uh, obviously huge problem. That's definitely understood. We're yeah. seeing a lot in in mental health. We're currently also looking at a company that is doing this, let's say, typical Tinder for patients and therapists with the main hypothesis that usually people drop out of therapy or after consultation number three of the therapy um, with a likability of more than 50%, just because there's not a good matchup between patient and therapist. And they take care of that, that matchmaking. There are also companies in the US that are already huge, like two chair that are following almost like a brick and mortar approach similar to Abbey Medical, uh, Sondermind, I think it's almost a unicorn uh, in US. Frame matching is another one, also US based. And there's also some players popping up in Europe. So my question is, are you mainly that? Like, like what's your, because you're having so many services and I'm feeling, don't you have to start somewhere and then go from there and, and build up all the other services? What's the, the go-to-market strategy there? Yeah, no, awesome question. And I think the, the main differentiating point for us is that we're, we're creating a platform for providers first. We think that by enabling them to be the best um, at providing their services and giving them the tools, reports, and data in a clean and easily understandable way, that they will bring in their customers to um, their recurring customers as well as um, new customers to build a bigger and better base. So indirectly with very little marketing at the beginning, we expect our user base to grow just by onboarding these different um, facilities and these organizations. So we also are planning to target um, more unconventional um, institutions such as universities, uh, police departments, veterans, hospitals, these people who often deal with the stress and struggles of working with people who are afflicted by mental and behavioral health issues, but don't always have access to the resources and um, knowledge necessary to deal with, with the burden of mental and behavioral health as it currently stands. Got it. Thanks. I would have some follow-ups, but I always want the others to get the chance to ask a question. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anas. Um, maybe Adam or Emily would like to continue. Yeah, maybe more of a comment, Rico, uh, as opposed to a question here. But anyway, just a suggestion. Um, open your pitch sort of describing all the capabilities of the platform. They look very comprehensive. But if, I would suggest that you start with your problem statement. Because I wasn't really, I, I, I got the sense that your platform does a lot of stuff, but I didn't really get a clear sense for what specific problem or problems you're solving and who you're solving them for. Yeah. Uh, and the most important part of your deck from an investor standpoint is the problem statement. Because if we don't think you're solving a big and urgent problem that somebody is willing to pay to solve, we, we really don't care what the platform does. We don't care how good your team is, um, you know, it's the problem statement that gets us excited and interested. And you know, we were early investors, uh, Emily mentioned it, in a company called Neuroflow, behavioral health platform. Um, they're, they're scaling like crazy right now. But they're, they're, you know, they're solving the issue that it's hard to access mental health on a bail. You know, Two thirds of people that need it don't get it. Uh, and they're solving the fact that in that population, it's hard to track sort of these exacerbations that lead to critical events. Right, it's, it's it's very clear what they're solving for. I, I'm not, I'm not clear on what problem you are solving for who right now. Okay, so the main problem that we're solving is when people who are in these crisis situations 
they don't know where to go. And even before then, the example given at the beginning of the pitch was, you know, you're coming home and you don't know what the next step is. The person hasn't attempted suicide yet because that would obviously be escalated to calling, um, you know, paramedics and stuff like that. But what do you do in, in the interim where you know there is a problem and are you going to look for a therapist? Are you going to look for a psychiatrist? You don't know, or most people don't know what next steps to take. And our app is going to clean that up and give people a very easy access of just entering in some basic information, um, actually very thorough information. And as soon as you register, you're you're delivered with suggestions on communities that you can join to help um, facilitate your um, uh, your healing process, as well as therapists or what or different modalities that we suggest based off of different profiles that we have seen um, similar to yours. And the longer that you use the app, and the more data that we get, the quicker and easier that process will become, because our end goal is to connect patients to, provi to providers um, who are their clinical fit the first time. That's our end goal. Yeah, thank you, Adam. Emily, would you like to add something? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think uh, good, good presentation. I think echoing what Adam is saying, um, just laying out very clearly, you know, what is what is the problem and how large is it? You know, what is the market size of this? Uh, makes sense kind of making these resources really clear and, and helping to triage. Um, and I think along with these screenshots of, of the app, it would be good to understand, you know, how folks engage and more about the go-to-market strategy. Because um, it seems like, you know, they'll, they'll need to engage with this. What does that look like? And then what does that care journey or kind of patient or consumer journey look like um, from beginning to end? And what is the end like outcome that you're hoping to achieve in terms of ROI? Um, I think I, like looking at the market valuation slide, I think it talks a little bit about who you ultimately go to and you have the subscriptions there in the pricing structure, which is trying to better understand um, you know, how, how it translates to what the outcomes you're looking for and, and uh, how you came up with the pricing. Yeah, no, awesome feedback. Um, I don't know if I have time to address that, Baton, or? Oh, we have almost a minute, yeah, can. Okay, well. um, yeah, no, excellent and great feedback. I think definitely the slides were there to, you know, um, address, but definitely bit off a little more than we could chew for the seven minute presentation, I believe. Um, but if I can go back, um, we see in the first um, example, this is like a lot, an example of a larger institution. Um, Ventura Office of Education is an actual connection that we have. And <clears throat> they have over 440,000 um, different students and 1300 wellness and mental health staff. So the, the pricing structure is based on how affordable can we make it so that we can outprice um, competition because we do believe that we offer such a unique fleet of services that if we can undercut what they are currently using for most of their services or not using at all, then we can really elicit and excite people enough to get them motivated to join. And then in the middle, we have a smaller institution example where the therapy collective, which is also um, a potential partner which we have connections with. There are only eight individual therapists and this $860 a month may sound like a lot, but if you split that up, that's $100 per person. And what they are potentially reaping is one cohesive platform where they can do and manage their entire organization. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much Rico and thanks so much for your contribution, Emily. Uh, time is up and and now move to the final page. Thank you again, Rico. Right, thank you, everyone. Thank you. And the last company is Good Somnia AB.
Robert, CTO, and also investor of the company will present the opportunity. Robert, feel free to share your screen and start the presentation. Okay, can I, it says I cannot share screen while the other participant is sharing. Uh, okay. I am trying to let go of this. All right, there okay. it is. Okay, I did. Go ahead, okay. Robert. Sorry. Um... So. Okay, there so it is. So I'm uh, Robert Oslund. Uh, I'm not the founder, but the first investor. Could Somnia offers a unique solution to help people who snore. Snoring affects many people. It is estimated that 40% of all men and 24% of all women snores. That means a total of 1.3 billion people worldwide. And most often it is the partners and not the snorers themselves that suffer the most. Snoring causes many problems. Besides relationships, it also affects the snorer's well-being and health. And in everyday life, it affects the personal performance as you don't sleep as well as you could. Besides surgery, which doesn't always work, and snoring can come back afterwards, today's alternatives are devices that you have to wear at night. And they only mask the problem. They may make, make it uncomfortable to sleep, and only give temporary relief. In contrast, good Sonia's solution has not to be worn at night. Instead, you only have to use it for two minutes a day, and already after three weeks, snoring is reduced to 50 to 65%. And it actually decreases the snoring and not just mask it. So how does it work? Is this too good to be true? We have a validation with 12 persons and their snoring was reduced with 50 to 65% after using it two minutes a day for three weeks. The validation was performed at an ENT clinic and all participants had polysomnography both before and after. And the doctors also reported that all participants felt better and more thoroughly rested. We have an approved patent in all major markets that cover the unique functionality of the device. It builds on scientific work that have proven that biomechanical stimulation strengthens the muscle and that strengthening the soft palate muscle reduces snoring. So the device is a mechanical muscle stimulator looking similar to the electrical toothbrush, which we plan to sell for 200 euros. It consists of a handle and a replaceable head, which will last for about six months and sell for 15 euros. Snoring, snoring is not classified as a, device, as a disease, but the device will fulfill class one for medical devices. The device is supported by an app. The basic app is free and record and analyze the snoring. It is used to first make an evaluation of your snoring, and then to track the improvements as you use the device. The public beta is already available both from Google Play and on App Store and has been downloaded over 17,000 times. There will also be a premium version that gives a more comprehensive analysis of your sleep and a version supporting ECG, which could indicate if you have sleep apnea or if you risk heart issues. They are priced at five or 10 euros per month. We will also offer personal ECG devices for either 250 or 150 euros. And we have seen a big interest in understanding the effects of your snoring better 
once you have started to record and analyze it. The total market is huge, also measured in euros. The anti-snoring device and snoring surgery market is estimated to be 1.1 billion euros in 2020, with an annual growth rate of 10%. And the sleep apnea market is already five times larger today. We have unfair advantages in this market. A device that has not to be used at night, but only two minutes per day, and actually reduces snoring. Protected by an international patent, supported by an already available app that could be scaled globally. And it is a consumer product that could be distributed through already available networks. Our revenue model is based on that this is a B2C product. The main revenue will come from device sales, which will have, which will have a high gross margin, but it will also have reoccurring revenue from our subscriptions. Sorry. We will sell directly, primarily online, through our own e-commerce solution that is already in place, and also sell indirect through established channels. And we have already been approached by pharmacy chains. Sales will be supported by the basic app as an entry point. And we are also looking into value-added resellers. We will start selling the product in Europe, which is our home market and where we have our main experience. In the following years, we will enter additional geographical markets and we conserve the numbers of sales in each country. The revenue earnings still will grow rapidly with the potential to reach 5 million euros in five years. Besides Hans Jürgen Henriksson, who is the founder and me in Stockholm, the work on the app development, e-commerce and marketing has been done by a very dedicated and skilled team, originally in Kharkiv, Ukraine. And we also have a qualified medical advisory board. We are looking for 200 to 500,000 euro. It will be used in the coming 12 to 18 months to primarily get the prototype commercial production, market launch, and build up sales. We are good Somnia. We believe that we can improve many people's life and health, build a solid and very profitable business based on that, and along the way, save a lot of relationships. Thank you very much. Oops, sorry, I was muted. Thanks so much, Robert. Great timing and very great presentation. Um, Antonio, do you have any comment or question? Yes, uh, on the last slide you comment stop snoring. And it's not clear to me if this is a curative approach. Are the people that are using your device, you know, snoring free and then they stay storing, uh, snoring free? Or is something that you need to use it all the time for the rest of your well, life? Well, um, basically the reason is that the soft palate muscle weakens over the years and it's a difficult muscle to exercise. So what you really this technique does is that it has the same effect as exercise. So after you used it for a few weeks, the effect may last for a few months, but you will then have to repeat it. Because then the, it strengthens the muscle and the muscle will weaken again. I see. And if you have you seen any, let's say over time, when you repeat this, have you seen some kind of declining in the effect of the device on the stimulation of muscle and the training? Um, we, I, so far, we haven't done any real long-term studies, but uh, um, the people have used it repeatedly. It seems the, the effect is repeatable. I see. And Robert, another thing that was coming in in the in the, when you were showing all the different prices and and, and the way that to go to mark and the way that you're approaching also the customers is. How did you come up with all these numbers? And and especially, I was thinking, what's what's the cost of goods that you are using here that you you are facing every time that you produce each of the single asset? And uh, what are your margin basically on some? On yeah. some uh, I mean, the heart is the device itself that we will uh, put into production. Um, and uh, once we get volumes, we expect to have a margin of about ninety percent of the hardware cost. 
but this based on uh, producing it in volume. It's not rocket science, but it's quite a um, sophisticated device because to get this effect, the head has two wheels that oscillate, and they have yeah. to oscillate in slightly different frequency to get this effect. I see. And uh, maybe you can comment, and I, I might have missed that, which you, you mentioned about the ACG part of the device. So yeah. that you have other hardware. And uh, why do you need the ACG part? And uh, the, the idea is to build a little ecosystem around the device, focusing on snoring and effects of snoring. And I, what has been shown is that actually snoring can lead to different heart issues. And uh, we, have, we are collaborating with the company that developed algorithms to predict this. But to make that prediction accurately, you need the ECG information too. I see. Okay. okay. And also to, to catch uh, apnea very accurately. I see. Yeah, I'll leave the floor to ask other questions from others in the, in the jury. Okay. Oh. Yeah, go ahead, Emily. Sorry. Yeah, no worries. No worries. I'd love to just hear a little bit more about your manufacturing. Plan and what are what do the cogs look like um, to manufacture the the hardware piece? The, the, the founder has a lot of experience on manufacturing in China, so the the plan is to manufacture it there. And as I said, we expect to have about ninety percent gross margin. So the manufacturing cost for each device is expected to be less than twenty dollars once we get up into volumes. But of course, we have to make the molds and all those things up front up front first. Get that okay. low cost. And then what's your plan for distribution and, and go to market, given it's, it's a bit more of a consumer solution rather than like a healthcare? Yes. Um, uh, as I said, it's the plan to start in Europe and then uh, actually China's a second market and then uh, roll it out during, over the world. And it's, as I said, snoring is not, even if it's a lot of effects, it's not seen as a disease. So the device by itself is not a medical device. So the idea is to uh, sell it directly to consumer. Uh, and I personally think that um, once we get out, uh, mouth to mouth will be a very effective uh, marketing tool for this. But also, as I mentioned, for example, pharmacists have shown interest to distribute it. And I think initially that would help to build, cred build credibility to have such uh, outlets too. But but uh, but as I also said, we have already built up the e-commerce solution, and if you go to our website, you can see it's prepared to sell directly. Got it. Yeah, thank you, Emily. Yeah, anyone else? Matt, Johan, Adam. Um, I Maybe can you... jump. Oh, go ahead, Adam. You shoot. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess just one quick question, you know, direct to consumer, um, how do you break through the noise level? I mean, if you search Amazon, there's a gazillion devices for snoring and without getting any kind of a medical clearance or running a prospective study, you know, how do you convince the market that this is, you know, truly safe and effective versus the thousands of other choices, you know, they, that, that um, you know, our challenge with devices like this has just been the customer acquisition costs tend to be so high to break through the noise. Yes, and initially we, we calculate with uh, quite a high position cost uh, and uh, the saving grace is the uh, low cost, cost of goods that leaves quite a lot of margin for that. But as I also mentioned, we have actually done a medically controlled validation uh, in the ENT clinic where the patient actually came in every day and a doctor monitoring it. And we did polysomnography both before and after to measure all the different parameters. So we have some um, solid uh, medical data to fall back on. Uh, and I think also, as I said, uh, it will take quite an effort, but we plan to start in Northern Europe and then expand in Europe to take it step by step. Uh, and I personally think that once we get it out, uh, people who use it will be uh, doing our best marketing. But of course we have to get a big presence in different channels, particularly uh, on social medias and channels like that. And then I also think the other thing with distributing through pharmacies and uh, that have by itself then give some credibility will also help. But I think the big barrier is to get out the first. I think once they are out, uh, it will uh, grow in, in the power of its uh, functionality.
that it really uh, addresses the cause. And it doesn't. And I can also see uh, as a previous question, or if you had to repeat it, uh, yes, eventually you will have to repeat it because the muscle had to be strengthened again, but it needs less time per day than to brush your teeth. And I think that in, to compa compare it with having a, something in your nose or a collar or something in your mouth or a vibrating pillow and all these other things out there, this is much, much more appealing. The free is money on marketing. And uh, I know that uh, Scandinavians, they know how to do that and how to market products. Speaking of our ring, um, interesting concept. Thank you and kudos for the presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, yeah, I, else? I, else? yeah. yeah Adam actually took the question um, right out of my mouth as well. Um, Cause definitely, uh, well, yeah, just because it's 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 going to be the difference between the European and the US markets. But no, overall, um, great pitch exp explained really well. Um, it, I guess the 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 one question um, would be how how do people know other than being kicked at night or, or woken up by your partner or family member? How how do people know or come to know that they'll need? your device because ultimately everybody will snore it's just a question of when that becomes a critical component um maybe it's a bigger it's probably a little bit of a bigger kind of glo more global question than i initially thought but how, how do i know that okay i have to start using this or i should start using this so i guess yeah, i think um i mean I think the, um, the marketing is probably most effective to yeah. the partner or someone being affected by it than the snorer itself. But the other thing is the basic app is a tool there too, because it's for free. And have, as I said, you have downloaded it many times already. And that gives you an indication of how much you snore, how often, how high, and so on. So you can get the measurement there too. But I think it's really uh, other people that are affected by it that I think is the most evident um yeah i say um breaking point when you want to address it and i think honestly if i would have had a bag with a thousand devices i would have sold them along the way so many people when you they ask you what they're doing like a turkish taxi driver in berlin or actually even some visa some fine visas i met said that i really would need that for my husband or for my wife so i think it's uh, the problem is definitely there. And uh, something I learned along the way is it's really an underestimated problem. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Back back to you, Batu. Yeah, thanks so much, Matt. And actually, time is up, but maybe we can just have a small comment from Johannes if you have anything to add. Maybe not question, but just a kind of feedback. You mean in general or with regards to Robert's presentation? Well, with regards presentation but also in general as well we took to the presentation um uh robert and i we already had the pleasure to get to know each other in person a couple of of months back so uh, we already had the, the the lengthy personal discussion so um, no additional comments unfortunately for out out of scope but i think um really good pitch and, and very interesting product obviously as i told him in person um with regards to over comments and feedback and maybe it makes sense for you to steer a little bit, given the time, what and how much each of us should say, if at all. Yeah, thanks so much, Johannes. And yeah, that's all for today. And um, thanks so much for all. Maybe if anyone else from the judge or from the audience wants to have, you know, say final words, Emily, Antonio, Matt, Otherwise, um, I will just say goodbye to everyone. Thanks. Thank you all. Thanks, okay, everyone. Thank you so much. But thank you. Before we leave, actually, oh my God, we will start living already. I was just, I want to just announce that we will um, schedule, schedule, actually, yeah, we will schedule another uh, health tech investment conference that was the end of, of March or early April. So we will announce this next week. And the format will be a bit different than that. Actually, uh, we are thinking to, you know, changing time a bit 
So for example, five minutes pitch and seven minute feedback and discussion so that we will have more companies up to 10, maybe 11. So I just wanted to announce that here as well and hope to see you um, at our future conferences as well. Thanks so much for joining. Thanks everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.